Have you ever Googled yourself? I'm guessing that we all have at one point or another, right? What did you find? Most people really honestly don't find much, but what if you found your entire medical history? Would that shock you? In 2010, WellPoint, an insurance provider, was made aware of a HIPAA breach when it was sued by an applicant who discovered she could see records of other health plan participants, 612,000 to be specific. Subsequent investigation by the OCR found that WellPoint didn't properly secure access to the data, allegedly caused by a software upgrade that affected the security. WellPoint did not evaluate the upgrade for risk and failed to implement protective controls and was eventually fined $1.7 million. Skaga County in Washington reported that it had accidentally published the receipts for seven medical tests on the internet. But the OCR investigation actually found nearly 1,600 individuals protected health information was exposed and that the county failed to disclose through their local breach notification laws. The county had never really implemented any HIPAA policies, never really trained their employees and virtually had no security controls. Eventually they were fined $215,000 that ultimately was paid for by, you guessed it, the taxpayers fund. Now this last one's a crazy one. Would two leading hospitals allow an IT tech to treat a patient? Now, I would guess not, but then why would they let a doctor install their own server to the network and expose nearly 7,000 people's PHI? These two hospitals allow faculty to serve as attending physicians and share some network infrastructure to allow data sharing. But the investigation revealed that a physician that had developed an application for the hospital had tried to bring the server down, but instead exposed records to search engines like Google. Both entities failed by not doing a security risk assessment and both failed to comply with their own security policies for access management. New York and Presbyterian was fined 3.3 million and Columbia University a million and a half. Hi, my name is Ken Kunim and I own North Star Technology Group. For the past 21 years, we've been helping organizations protect their information and reputation. Now I'm guessing some of you represent organizations that have direct compliance regulations, whether that's HIPAA, GDPR, CMMC, et cetera. But it is important to understand that cybersecurity is crucial, even if you're not specifically subjected to official compliance regulations. Standards such as federal government's NIST are equally important to help protect your data and reputations. However, fulfilling compliance obligations for one or more of these standards is definitely an uphill task and choosing to sidelines compliance and stay non-compliant will honestly only invite trouble. The key really is to leverage turnkey compliance management solutions to help end most of those compliance goals. But don't forget that compliance requires sustained effort on so many levels. Today, you will learn what the driving force behind privacy and security regulations are. Hint, it may not be the government. Why compliance should be a top priority for your business and how to leverage the power of process automation to help achieve and maintain compliance in the long term. So what really is compliance? Now, by definition, it is simply conforming to or being obedient with the rules, laws, and mandates of applicable regulatory bodies or standards. And various compliance regulations exist to help companies improve their data security strategy by providing guidelines and best practices. Now, often these are based on an organization's industry or the type of data that the companies maintain. Personal healthcare information, confidential government data for the Department of Defense, and even personal information um, of consumers, uh, such as what is protected under GDPR. Now, there are many myths around compliance. What is covered? Who is covered? And although we aren't going to go into detail about each regulation standard, some common myths do exist. First, Many believe that you only need to protect the system that holds that specific data you are supposed to protect. But we found in years of doing assessments that this data often is stored in places not on those servers. Many also believe that if they use file sharing or cloud-based systems that they are automatically secure or compliant, but all protected data needs to be secured. And at the end of the day, you are still connecting from local networks. So some early takeaways on compliance. Compliance is hard. Maybe you've heard the joke about how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time. It really honestly applies to compliance. Also, compliance is defined and refined at the local level. Each state has specific rules around certain things. A good example of this is breach notification laws. Some states like California have much stricter laws requiring notification within 15 days of a discovered breach. And finally, 
Although it may take 50 or so steps to secure your information, remember that many of those things cannot be done by your IT team alone. It is important that senior leaders get involved and that this is a top-down initiative. Now, doesn't it seem like there is a new compliance standard coming out every year? And although not entirely true, the list is definitely growing. Some of the more prevalent standards that may affect you include GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation. This rule sets guidelines for the collection and processing of personal information for people typically living in the EU, the European Union. The, ski, the key scope issue here is that this law doesn't really care where the website or service is located. So if you have a site or service that attracts European visitors, this law may apply to you. And under this rule, visitors must be given information about what data is collected and people are allowed to receive disclosures of what you're collecting and how you're collecting it. You've all probably seen websites that now provide uh, disclaimers about cookies and data collection, and often it has been driven by GDPR. HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, is a standard to protect patient health information. And the original intent of this law was to allow people to move from one job to another without losing health insurance, thus the portability part. 2003, the privacy rule came out, and in 2005, the security rule came into effect to help provide guidance in protecting health electronic data. When this first came out, no one could have anticipated the number of security breaches that would be caused by business associates, those organizations that work directly with covered entities, uh, medical providers, hospitals, or health plans. Also, cloud services were really not a consideration. The High Tech Act in 2009 added additional guidelines and funding for enforcement. And finally, in 2013, the Office for Civil Rights, the OCR, released the Omnibus Final Rule that really covered those business associates. NIST, which is an overall cybersecurity framework based on the federal government under the National Institute of Science and Technology. Many standards, compliance standards today, have a crosswalk to or are actually based on NIST. The standard is based on what they call core, which is a set of desired outcomes based on categories and their associated references back to the rule. There's five different areas or core areas or functions within NIST. First is to identify. This is you, where you learn what assets you have. Second is protection. Set up policy and systems to provide protection around data security. Three is detection. Set up systems to help determine when something bad happens. Four, response or respond. Set up process and systems to deal with breaches and deal with them, respond to them, incident response. And then finally recover. Set up process and systems to help recover data or operations, basically your business continuity. Now, 2020 and 2021 have been seriously unprecedented in terms of rising cybersecurity threats and changes in the threat landscape. We have all seen news reports of the gas suppliers, meat processing breaches, and now the federal government is getting involved by issuing an executive order. This executive order has several sections in it, but there are a few that may apply to you and I and our businesses. Section three, the federal government wants to modernize their cybersecurity uh, infrastructure, and they will believe that they will lead through example by implementing foundational tools like multi-factor authentication, where we provide two forms of ID, right, to log into critical applications, um, or encryption, right, where we scramble in a good way where only the good guys can read on your data. Section four is about supply chain management, establishing baseline standards on software development, in particular software sold to the federal government. Section six is incident response playbooks. They wanna build standardized incident response plans for, to help every single government agency play by the same rules in case there is a data breach. Section seven is about threat detection, building government-wide endpoint detection and response EDR system, essentially your antivirus, your anti-malware um, across all of government agencies. And finally, section eight is about investigation and remediation, requiring agents to enable security logs and analyze those security logs to better detect breaches respond to them and mitigate their damage. Now, many assume it is the government that is the driving force behind all of these standards and rules, but the truth is we are the real force behind this. How many of you guys go to Starbucks? I'm sure most of us at some point or another, right? Now, before a lot of the technology that we all rely on was in place, Starbucks would actually write down the order of every single customer and put it in a filing system so they knew what that customer had the last time. And generally, this was well received. Now, the internet age has drastically increased the rate of consumer data collection. And today, over 70% of people 
have some level of concern over the protection of that information. And in particular, what companies are doing with that information. Now, of course, at that point, governments then get involved and start implementing rules and standards like GDPR. Naturally, the result of these standards are burdens on you and me. Threats are always evolving, seemingly changing by the minute. The rules change constantly. And in order to avoid penalties, organizations need to provide proof that they are following the rules. Even insurance providers are requiring this today. Three years ago, our cyber liability insurance policy was a three question app. Now it's just the ransomware addendum alone was three pages and that's just to get coverage. Even more proof of evidence is required if you ever want to make a claim. And none of us have unlimited resources, right? And because this is the law, none of us can ignore it. Even for organizations that believe they don't fall under any of these regulations, it is critical to take cybersecurity protection seriously. Data and reputations still need protection. These laws, unfortunately, were written by lawmakers for bureaucrats, often trying to cover a wide range and size of organization. And like I said, we just can't ignore it. Audits are coming more and more common, and when they result in penalties, the cheap route doesn't look so cheap after all. The one thing that we can learn from other people's pain that receive penalties is it shows us what that organization did to get in trouble so we could hopefully avoid it. The underlying cause that led to the breach risk and how that breach or violation links to a specific rule and how much that organization was fine and what actions were required to prevent it from happening again. Phoenix Cardiac Surgery Center used a free cloud email application to communicate protected info and a free cloud-based calendar to schedule those patient visits. Ultimately, they were audited, fined $100,000. Why? Well, number one, they failed to provide security awareness training to their staff. They failed to implement security controls to protect that data. They failed to assign a security officer, which is required under HIPAA. And ultimately, they failed to conduct a cybersecurity risk assessment. And I'll come back to the importance of that in a second. Now, I mentioned a few times how threats evolve. The good news is, is that this, when this happens, the regulating authorities update the guidelines, helping businesses strengthen their, their infrastructure while ultimately mitigating their risk. Now, if your organization follows these guidelines and best practices mandated by these standards, it gives your organization the best possible shot at protecting your data and reputation. And I can't tell you how many business leaders tell me that they don't need to worry about cybersecurity protections, compliance, or standards because their data is in the cloud. The cloud definitely provides massive value around growth and flexibility, but those systems still need protection, just like any other data source. And like I said before, at the end of the day, you still access the cloud from local network resources. Now, what happens if you just simply ignore all of this and roll the dice? Unfortunately, the stats just simply are not not in your favor. 61% of small businesses have experienced some cyber attack right, whether they even know it or not. They may simply have been caught in the line of fire. In 2019, cybersecurity attacks cost small and medium businesses on average $2.2 million. A million of that due to damage or theft of the data and the other half due to disruption of normal business operations. And the statistic that I think just blows my mind is that 81% of small and medium business report that they, if they pay a ransom, they will get attacked a second or more time. Why is that? Well, certainly they have demonstrated that they are what we call a soft target. They're willing to pay a ransom. Two, they, they have obviously have some sort of vulnerability. <clears throat> and even more crazy is that over 20% of organizations that have a vulnerability that's exposed don't do anything to fix it. Abigail Hinchy, which is a Walgreens customer, had a child fathered by her ex-boyfriend, Davian Peterson. Peterson told his new girlfriend, Audra Withers, who happened to be a Walgreens pharmacist, that he was the father of Hinchy's child and that he may have contracted a STD and passed to her. Hinchy received harassing text messages from Peterson saying that he had a printout of her prescriptions and accused her of being negligent with her birth control resulting in her getting pregnant. Peterson threatened to release this info unless she dropped her paternity suit. Hinchy found out through a simple, basic internet search that Peterson had ended up marrying that pharmacist with her. Hinchy complained to Walgreens, but their response was light. Basically, a slap on the wrist, a warning, and more training for Wither. Hinchy filed suit alleging malpractice, evasion of privacy, and public disclosure of private facts, and won. The jury awarded 80%, which is $1.4 million, against Walgreens and Withers for malpractice, and another 20% against Peterson. 
So some lessons here, don't think your biggest threat is your, the government catching you in violation. It could actually be your customer. Consider your disciplinary process. Sometimes light punishments may help you lose. And don't respond to lawsuits without consulting an attorney that understands your specific compliance regulations and your business. Okay, so while I've spent a while setting the stage by defining compliance, framing the importance of following cybersecurity best practices, and what the outcome could be if you ignore all this stuff. But what do you do? What do you actually do? Step one, get a cybersecurity risk assessment, like right now. And by cybersecurity risk assessment, we define that as the process of evaluating your technical, your administrative, and your physical controls with the goal of identifying weaknesses and building a plan to fix it. And it all starts with this. But like a doctor's physical, you can't really do this yourself. It requires years of experience to understand the risk and threats. Some things that we found during all of our years doing cybersecurity risk assessments is that data ends up in places where customers said that no data should exist, backups that weren't happening, systems not getting patched. I know this seems kind of cliche, but we do find passwords taped to displays. Uh, recently found a firewall that had expired services and basically it was a brick. So users are storing data in public free services. We did an SRA about six months ago for a customer and determined that they had no offsite backup, which was a requirement for their, for their compliance. The customer told us that they were in fact paying an outside IT vendor and they were getting charged $700 a month for this service. Essentially, they had been paying for nothing for six months and were just getting lucky that they didn't have to do a restore. So some life lessons here. Make sure that you require proof, right? That things are working as they should, whether it's your internal IT or your outsourced IT. In fact, for when it comes to backups, require an actual test restore. Don't just rely on the report. Certainly if you're non-technical, review the results with someone that can help explain these technical pieces. And ultimately you should really outsource your risk assessment to someone with the skills, experience, the tools to do it right. South Broward Hospital, which is doing business as Memorial Health, reported that two employees inappropriately accessed patient info. Later investigation found 12 others. The result was a federal criminal charge of selling PHI and filing fraudulent tax returns. The OCR investigation found 80,000 patient records had been accessed by a former employee who was fired, but still had access. They determined that the organization failed to implement procedures to review records of information system activity like logs, access reports, and security incident tracking. And ultimately they're fined five and a half million dollars. And the moral of this particular story is part of the risk assessment, your organization's technical and administrative controls should be reviewed. And the most common lessons that we found, use a, use a domain if, you use, if you're a Microsoft shop, turn on activity logging on all systems and have something to analyze those 24 hour, hours a day and alert, keep those logs. If you're dealing with ransomware or worried about ransomware, implement a multi-layer approach, security awareness training, right? Teaching people how to recognize phishing emails. Make sure your firewalls and your anti-malware, your endpoint security are current and updated and on every machine. Make sure you set up white application whitelisting, right? And blacklisting, and obviously make sure your backups are solid. And from the last lesson, make sure they're tested. Don't forget to encrypt your data. Uh, often if a laptop or a device is stolen or lost, if you have proof that you've encrypted your data, you may not have to report it. Use software to manage your patch patches, automate antivirus and your email security, have a detailed and robust security awareness tra training for your team, implement password management tools, right? Where you can implement complex passwords for all your applications. Uh, Multi-factor authentication is very important and make sure you build policies around all of these things, uh, but make sure that they are enforceable. I can't tell you how many times we've met with a compliance officer and asked questions about a policy and they had no idea what we were talking about. 26.5 million veterans records from the VA were stolen, including names, social security numbers, and date of birth from the home of an employee who improperly took the material back to his house on a laptop. Now, the next area we review during an SRA is around physical security. And the biggest lessons there are making sure you encrypt those devices. Like I said earlier, make sure you have policies around taking physical or electronic records off site and figure out a way to enforce those and make sure you're physically securing those records, computers and files, keep servers and lock data centers, closet, log access and have a policy to determine who can actually get to that stuff. 
Now we have assisted so many organizations after their data breaches that require audits. And what we have found is that there is no such thing as being fully compliant. But having a book of evidence of compliance efforts greatly reduces the hassle you get from governing bodies. The secret sauce is the ability to collect this data and report on it easily. The problem is most organizations face is that data collection and reporting for compliance purposes is cumbersome and a manual process. And that often leads to this stuff just simply not getting done. It really is important to automate this stuff. And I like to talk about the risk sandwich and who has to eat it. The bottom line, it is your responsibility to manage your own business risk. No one can do that for you. You can certainly partner with somebody to help you, but no one can do it for you. It is your responsibility to choose your vendors, employees, supply chain, and contractors carefully and ensure that they are also compliant. But Ken, I have cyber liability insurance and don't have to really worry about this stuff, right? Cottage Health paid an IT vendor to install a server. It was accidentally exposed on the internet. 30,000 records became Google searchable. Class action lawsuit was brought against Cottage Health and the IT vendor, but since the IT vendor did not have insurance, Cottage Health asked their insurance provider for financial and legal protection. Their insurance provider, Columbia Casualty, responded and settled the lawsuit for $4 million and continued their own investigation. Columbia Casualty discovered discrepancies between what Cottage Health said in their insurance application and what they were really doing and sued Cottage Health to get that $4 million back. It did not matter if Cottage Health was mistaken on their application, and the lawsuit claims that the breach was caused by Cottage Health failure to maintain security risk controls it said it was doing on their application. Even with insurance, it is still your responsibility to implement security best practices. Of course, you should always have errors and omissions insurance and have enough coverage based on your risk tolerance, but you can't use insurance as a substitute for a robust security and compliance program. It is getting harder and harder to renew these policies and even more difficult to get claims approved without having those things in place. Compliance is not a one and done thing. It requires constant review and effort. Risk assessments should be done annually at a minimum. The findings should be reviewed and mitigated quickly. You should have a system that automates documenting these things and allows for easy reporting, and you should have systems in place to continuously monitor for vulnerabilities. So what do we learn, right? Let's pull it all together. Number one, get a cybersecurity risk assessment done ASAP. Get good errors and emissions plus your cyber insurance policy. Partner with an insurance agent that understands your business, your industry, and your compliance regulations. Remember that compliance is not just IT's responsibility. Get involved at the top. And everyone always asks me, Ken, what are some basic security things that I can put in place right now that will have a big impact? I always say encrypt your, all of your devices, right? File level or, or um, OS level, make sure that they're encrypted. Number two, implement multi-factor authentication. Implement email security to protect from viruses and phishing attempts. Make sure you train your employees on all things related to security awareness. Use software and people to analyze your security logs and use password managers to allow for complex passwords. And finally, create policy and procedures around all of these things. But again, as I said earlier, make sure that they can be enforced. Now, here's the salesy part. This stuff is hard. I get it, right? But the best thing that you can do for your organization is partner with someone that has the skills, the experience, and the tools to do this right. Thank you.